96 is also a special number. Uh, and the impact of 96 being a number with, has a lot of things that go into it is the Fahrenheit scale it was based upon 96. Zero was the coldest that Fahrenheit could make in the lab and 96 was what he made by temperature. I don't know if he was just cold that day or um, our measuring has changed since then. But 60 is a special number and the Babylonians also had a connection with the equilateral triangle because there was a certain perfection to it. Actually, uh, ancient times there was a lot of importance placed to things with rotational and translational symmetry. But if we combine the two, so if the equilateral triangle is special and 60 is special, why don't we make each of these 60? Now if I take six of these and I can put them into a wedge, then that's 60, 60, 60, 60, 60, 60. In other words, 360 all the way around. We now call it degrees. So that's where 360 degrees come from. However, that's all based upon the specialness of 60. There's nothing, you know, if they had made 50, then this would be, then it'd be 300 degrees in a circle. So especially in the 18th century, 18th and 19th century, there was an attempt by mathematicians to get rid of all the man-made structures. Uh, there's no reason to, since 60 was deep comes from people, they thought, is there something more fundamental? And what they realized is that if I take any circle, no matter what that circle is, and then I take the radius, all circles have a radius, so they'll take that length right there. So imagine you got a circle, you got a string, the length of the radius, and then they wrap it around. So this, the arc length here is one radius long. What they realize is that this angle here is the same, no matter what circle you take. The radius, if you wrap it around the arc as an arc length, you always get the same angle. And this, they felt, was not man-made. This, so they made this one radian. Therefore, how many radians are there around an entire circle? Uh, an entire circle, and you did half a circle. What was it? You did half a circle. Oh, yeah, yeah, 6.28. Yeah, approximately. Or 2 pi. Yeah. So, circumference of a circle is 2 pi radiuses, 2 pi radii. 2 pi times the radius is the circumference of a circle, and each radius along the length right here is another radian, and so therefore there's 2 pi radians. going all the way around the circle. Uh, and just throw this in for the trivia. Gradients, I've never actually seen it used except it was on my calculator uh, a number of years ago where it's 100 gradients per quarter. All right, so we have this relationship between a circle and radians between the radius and radians, and we can take it one step further. The fact that if I have two radiuses, an arc length of two radii, two radii, two times the radius, I have two radians here in the angle. If I have two and a half radiuses, I have two and a half radians, and so on. In other words, the arc length. It's going to be equal to the radius times the angle, where this is in radians. That's an, an identity that will pop up again and again. So arc length is equal to the radius times the angle in radians. So if I have an arc length of five meters, so that's the distance around the outside, and a radius of two meters, so from the center to the edge, 
what angle would be subtended? So drawing a circle right there. We'll pretend that's a circle. I have my radius of two meters, and then I'm going around the edge, basically five meters. What angle is that? So over here, uh, questions before I connect it back to what we were doing? So this distance from here to here is going to be the radius of the circle times the angle. So the distance from here to the central point is just the radius times the angle. So the distance from here to here, the total distance it's traveling from this point to this point is going to be two times that. This takes r phi to get to here and then another r phi to get to there, or the whole angle is two phi. So I know that the speed is distance over time. And the distance it's traveling is two r phi in some time t. So I have a way of figuring out time there. So from this, the time is equal to 2r5 over b. You can make that substitution over here. So this becomes negative 2b sine phi j hat divided by 2r5 over b. Well, the twos cancel out, that's convenient. Uh, R doesn't cancel out. Uh, I'm dividing by B in the denominator, so that's like multiplying on top. So I end up with negative B squared sine phi J hat over R phi. Unfortunately, this formula still uses phi, which I threw in there, that's nothing. You know, if I swing something in a circle, I know that phi is small. That, that's about it. Uh, McLaurin series, Taylor series, any of that sound familiar to any of you? Okay. Any function can be written as series of sine of trig functions added together and likewise any trig function can be written as a series of polynomials written summed together. And I think this is Taylor series as opposed to the Clarence series, uh, but I could have this backwards. Sine of theta or sine of any angle is equal to that angle, assuming the angle and radians minus phi cubed over three factorial plus phi to the fifth over five factorial minus phi to the seventh over seven factorial and so on. Just as a side note, cosine of phi is one minus phi squared over two factorial plus phi to the fourth over four factorial minus phi to the sixth over six factorial and so on. So if phi is small, so think of phi as a, a small number, we'll just take 0.1 for now, and have sine of 0.1, get rid of some stuff, we'll pass this. So if phi is equal to 0.1, then the sine of 0.1 is equal to 0.1 minus 
minus 0.1 cubed over 6 plus uh, 0.1 to the fifth power over 120 minus 0.1 to the seventh power over whatever seven factorial is. What's the approximate value? What's point one cubed? That's point one squared. Oh. Yeah, two zeros. So this is point zero zero one, and then I'll divide by six. What is point one to the fifth power? Seventh power. I'll just go ahead and spoil that for you. So notice that each of the subsequent terms gets smaller and smaller. And so if I was just doing a, a quick approximation, and this is for phi equal to 0.1, about five degrees, the sine of 0.1 is approximately 0.1. As phi gets smaller and smaller, these terms drop off even more drastically. If, if I'm talking about 0.01, I get 0.01 minus, well, 0.01 cubed is 0.000001 over 6 plus 0.1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, and 1 over 120, and so forth. They drop off even faster. So if phi is incredibly small, then sine of phi is roughly equal to the same value. This is known as the small angle approximation. Because remember, all this was developed prior to computers and calculators, or back when computers were referred to were titles of people. So if phi is small, then the sine of phi is approximately equal to phi which is approximately equal to the tangent of phi. Small angle approximation. Since I'm letting phi be small, my equation right here then becomes negative b squared phi j hat over r phi, and the phi's cancel out, and I'm left with just negative v squared. Let me see if I can write that better. Negative v squared over r j hat. So when this object is right here, the acceleration is towards the center, and it has a magnitude of the speed squared divided by the radius. We, of course, have a name for that. What is the name for the acceleration that happens because of change in direction? So in awe of this that he just has rendered you speechless. The direction is towards the center. So I introduce a new unit vector. I hat, think back, I hat is in whatever direction we want it to be. J hat is perpendicular to that, so we've got some flexibility there, but somewhat limiting. 
And once I hat and J hat are set, K hat becomes automatic in a right-handed coordinate system. But R hat has a little bit special meaning. R hat is a unit vector away from the center. R hat, the hat tells you it's a unit vector. Unit vector pointing away from the center. Now there's some flexibility about what center are we talking about, but if I have something traveling in a circle, the center is the center of the circle. If I want to have something pointing towards the center, well, that's what the negative does. So therefore, negative r hat points toward the center using our traditional negative means opposite direction. Questions to hear before I get on the soapbox? Figuratively. about that other word, and potentially this will be the last time we ever mention it. There is a proper way to use this word, either pronounced centrifugal or centrifugal. Uh, most of the time when people use this word, they actually mean centripetal or centripetal, depends upon how you want to pronounce it. Let's think about the root of the word. Century, in both cases, means center. Pencil, well actually, let's do this one. This one's a little bit easier. The fugue, as in fugitive, means what? What does a fugitive do? Run away. So this is center lead. There's also a, a Latin expression that I occasionally hear in TV shows, uh, tempus fugit, which means time flies. So if I have something that is trying to go away from the center, that's when this is appropriate. If I have something towards the center, centripetal. So PET comes from a root meaning seeking. Now we do have uh, various words that have the PET in it that do mean seeking. Uh, open it up. What words do we have in English where P-E-T means seeking at the root? Position. Say it again. Position. Uh, yeah, that was the one I was thinking of, but yeah. I... Petal? As in uh, a flower petal? Or, yeah. or, or the foot petal? Is that a D? I think that's a D. The flower, I think, is a T, but I'm not quite, I can't connect it to this. Uh, also, competition. Two groups come together seeking each other out. Compete. Compete, yeah. So, now, this can be used correctly again. There's a comic I used to have posted out, outside my office when I was in Ardmore, where I, I have to find it again. It would be better than my telling. Um, but most of the time, people are using it, they use it incorrectly. And so probably for the sake of this course, 
don't use this word. Thus the mystery gum sticker. So we're talking about centripetal motion. And if there is centripetal acceleration, there has to be a centripetal force. Because if velocity is changing, there's acceleration. And if there's acceleration, there has to be some outside force. In the case of my swing the, the string around, the centripetal force was part of the tension. We are not adding to F tom because at this point, the centripetal force will be some part or combination of those forces. So let's just take a nice ideal example here. Uh, actually, let's. has a hole in it and I've got an object here that is swinging on a string and I got another one hanging out down here from the, so it's a side view from the overhead view with that hole in the middle got a string attached to a box that is swinging around like that so it's overhead make this three kilogram mass. Uh, let's make this a five kilogram mass. Let's make the radius uh, 0.1 meters. And I want to know what is the speed if the five kilogram mass is in equilibrium. What is the speed of the three kilogram mass? So if five kilogram in equilibrium speed of the three kilogram mass equals what? Some difficulty with question marks right now. All right, there we go. We're going to approach this the exact same way we approached the other problems. Force diagram. All right, so let's do a force diagram of that three kilogram mass. 